section four of a treatise concerning the principles of human knowledge by george barclay this librivox recording is in the public domain of the principles of human knowledge continued fifty three as to the opinion that there are no corporeal causes this has been heretofore maintained by some of the schoolmen as it is of late by others among the modern philosophers who though they allow matter to exist yet will have god alone to be the immediate efficient cause of all things these men saw that amongst all the objects of sense there was none which had any power or activity included in it and that by consequence this was likewise true of whatever bodies they supposed to exist without the mind like unto the immediate objects of sense but then that they should suppose an innumerable multitude of created beings which they acknowledge are not capable of producing any one effect in nature and which therefore are made to no manner of purpose since god might have done everything as well without them this i say though we should allow it possible must yet be a very unaccountable and extravagant supposition fifty four eighth objection twofold answer in the eighth place the universal concurrent assent of mankind may be thought by some an invincible argument in behalf of matter or the existence of external things must we suppose the whole world to be mistaken and if so what cause can be assigned of so widespread and predominant an error i answer first that upon a narrow inquiry it will not perhaps be found so many as is imagined to really believe the existence of matter or things without the mind strictly speaking to believe that which involves a contradiction or has no meaning in it is impossible and whether the foregoing expressions are not of that sort i refer it to the impartial examination of the reader in one sense indeed men may be said to believe that matter exists that is they act as if the immediate cause of their sensations which affects them every moment and is so nearly present to them were some senseless unthinking being but that they should clearly apprehend any meaning marked by those words and form thereof a settled speculative opinion is what i am not able to conceive this is not the only instance wherein men impose upon themselves by imagining they believe those propositions which they have often heard though at bottom they have no meaning in them fifty five but secondly though we should grant a notion to be never so universally and steadfastly adhered to yet this is weak argument of its truth to whoever considers what a vast number of prejudices and false opinions are everywhere embraced with the utmost tenaciousness by the unreflecting which are the far greater part of mankind there was a time when the antipodes and motion of the earth were looked upon as monstrous absurdities even by men of learning and if it be considered what a small proportion they bear to the rest of mankind we shall find that at this day those notions have gained but a very inconsiderable footing in the world fifty six ninth objection answer but it is demanded that we assign a cause of this prejudice and account for its obtaining in the world to this i answer that men knowing they perceived several ideas whereof they themselves were not the authors as not being excited from within nor depending on the operation of their wills this made them maintain those ideas or objects of perception had an existence independent of and without the mind without ever dreaming that a contradiction was involved in those words but philosophers having plainly seen that the immediate objects of perception do not exist without the mind they in some degree corrected the mistake of the vulgar but at the same time run into another which seems no less absurd to wit that there are certain objects really existing without the mind or having a subsistence distinct from being perceived of which our ideas are only images or resemblances imprinted by those objects on the mind and this notion of the philosophers owes its origin to the same cause with the former namely their being conscious that they were not the authors of their own sensations which they evidently knew were imprinted from without and which therefore must have some cause distinct from the minds on which they are imprinted fifty seven but why they should suppose the ideas of sense to be excited in us by things in their likeness and not rather have recourse to spirit which alone can act may be accounted for first because they were not aware of the repugnancy there is one as well in supposing things like unto our ideas existing without as in two attributing to them power or activity secondly 
because the supreme spirit which excites those ideas in our minds is not marked out and limited to our view by any particular finite collection of sensible ideas as human agents are by their size complexion limbs and motions and thirdly because his operations are regular and uniform whenever the course of nature is interrupted by a miracle men are ready to own the presence of a superior agent but when we see things go on in the ordinary course they do not excite in us any reflection their order and concatenation though it be an argument of the greatest wisdom power and goodness in their creator is yet so constant and familiar to us that we do not think them the immediate effects of a free spirit especially since inconsistency and mutability in acting though it be an imperfection is looked on as a mark of freedom fifty eight tenth objection answer tenthly it will be objected that the notions we advance are inconsistent with several sound truths in philosophy and mathematics for example the motion of the earth is now universally admitted by astronomers as a truth grounded on the clearest and most convincing reasons but on the foregoing principles there can be no such thing for motion being only an idea it follows that if it be not perceived it exists not but the motion of the earth is not perceived by sense i answer that tenet if rightly understood will be found to agree with the principles we have premised for the question whether the earth moves or no amounts in reality to no more than this to wit whether we have reason to conclude from what has been observed by astronomers that if we were placed in such and such circumstances and such or such a position and distance both from the earth and sun we should perceive the former to move among the choir of the planets and appearing in all respects like one of them and this by the established rules of nature which we have no reason to mistrust is reasonably collected from the phenomena fifty nine we may from the experience we have had of the train and succession of ideas in our minds often make i will not say uncertain conjectures but sure and well-grounded predictions concerning the ideas we shall be affected with pursuant to a great train of actions and be enabled to pass a right judgment of what would have appeared to us in case we were placed in circumstances very different from those we are in at present herein consists the knowledge of nature which may preserve its use and certainty very consistently with what has been said it will be easy to apply this to whatever objections of the like sort may be drawn from the magnitude of the stars or any other discoveries in astronomy or nature sixty eleventh objection in the eleventh place it will be demanded to what purpose serves that curious organization of plants and the animal mechanism in the parts of animals might not vegetables grow and shoot forth leaves of blossoms and animals perform all their motions as well without as with all that variety of internal parts so elegantly contrived and put together which being ideas have nothing powerful or operative in them nor have any necessary connection with the effects ascribed to them if it be a spirit that immediately produces every effect by a fiat or act of his will we must think all that is fine and artificial in the works whether of man or nature to be made in vain by this doctrine though an artist has made the spring and wheels and every movement of a watch and adjusted them in such a manner as he knew would produce the motions he designed yet he must think all this done to no purpose and that it is an intelligence which directs the index and points to the hour of the day if so why may not the intelligence do it without his being at the pains of making the movements and putting them together why does not an empty case serve as well as another and how comes it to pass that whenever there is any fault in the going of a watch there is some corresponding disorder to be found in the movements which being mended by a skilful hand all is right again the like may be said of all the clockwork of nature great part whereof is so wonderfully fine and subtle as scarce to be discerned by the best microscope in short it will be asked how upon our principles any tolerable account can be given or any final cause assigned of an innumerable multitude of bodies and machines framed with the most exquisite art which in the common philosophy have very apposite uses assigned them and serve to explain abundance of phenomena sixty one answer to all which i answer first that though there were some difficulties relating to the administration of providence and the uses by it assigned to the several parts of nature which i could not solve by the foregoing principles yet this objection could be of small weight against the truth and certainty of those things which may be proved a priori with the utmost evidence and rigour of demonstration secondly 
but neither are the received principles free from the like difficulties for it may still be demanded to what end god should take those roundabout methods of effecting things by instruments and machines which no one can deny might have been effected by the mere command of his will without all that apparatus nay if we narrowly consider it we shall find the objection may be retorted with greater force on those who hold the existence of those machines without of mind for it has been made evident that solidity bulk figure motion and the like have no activity or efficacy in them so as to be capable of producing any one effect in nature see section twenty five whoever therefore supposes them to exist allowing the supposition possible when they are not perceived does it manifestly to no purpose since the only use that is assigned to them as they exist unperceived is that they produce those perceivable effects which in truth cannot be ascribed to anything but spirit sixty two fourthly but to come nigher the difficulty it must be observed that though the fabrication of all those parts and organs be not absolutely necessary to the producing any effect yet it is necessary to the producing of things in a constant regular way according to the laws of nature there are certain general laws that run through the whole chain of natural effects these are learned by the observation and study of nature and are by men applied as well to the framing artificial things for the use and ornament of life as to the explaining various phenomena which explication consists only in showing the conformity any particular phenomenon has to the general laws of nature or which is the same thing in discovering the uniformity there is in the production of natural effects as will be evident to whoever shall attend to the several instances wherein philosophers pretend to account for appearances that there is a great and conspicuous use in these regular constant methods of working observed by the supreme agent has been shown in section thirty one and it is no less visible that a particular size figure motion and disposition of parts are necessary though not absolutely to the producing of any effect yet to the producing it according to the standing mechanical laws of nature thus for instance it cannot be denied that god or the intelligence that sustains and rules the ordinary course of things might if he were minded to produce a miracle cause all the motions on the dial plate of a watch though nobody had ever made the movements and put them in it but yet if he will act agreeably to the rules of mechanism by him for wise ends established and maintained in the creation it is necessary that those actions of the watchmaker whereby he makes the movements and rightly adjusts them precede the production of the aforesaid motions as also that any disorder in them be attended with the perception of some corresponding disorder in the movements which being once corrected all is right again sixty three it may indeed on some occasions be necessary that the author of nature display his overruling power in producing some appearance out of the ordinary series of things such exceptions from the general rules of nature are proper to surprise and awe men into an acknowledgment of the divine being but then they are to be used but seldom otherwise there is a plain reason why they should fail of that effect besides god seems to choose the convincing our reason of his attributes by the works of nature which discover so much harmony and contrivance in their make and are such plain indications of wisdom and beneficence in their author rather than to astonish us into a belief of his being by anomalous and surprising events sixty four to set this matter in a yet clearer light i shall observe that what has been objected in section sixty amounts in reality to no more than this ideas are not anyhow and at random produced there being a certain order and connection between them like to that of cause and effect there are also several combinations of them made in a very regular and artificial manner which seem like so many instruments in the hand of nature that being hid as it were behind the scenes have a secret operation in producing those appearances which are seen on the theatre of the world being themselves discernible only to the curious eye of the philosopher but since one idea cannot be the cause of another to what purpose is that connection and since those instruments being barely inefficacious perceptions in the mind are not subservient to the production of natural effects it is demanded why they are made or in other words what reason can be assigned why god should make us upon a close inspection into his works behold so great variety of ideas so artfully laid together and so much according to rule it not being credible that he would be at the expense if one may so speak of all that art and regularity to no purpose 65 to all which my answer is first that the connection of ideas does not imply the relation of cause and effect but only of a mark or sign with the thing signified 
the fire which i see is not the cause of the pain i suffer upon my approaching it but the mark that forewarns me of it in like manner the noise that i hear is not the effect of this or that motion or collision of the ambient bodies but the sign thereof secondly the reason why ideas are formed into machines that is artificial and regular combinations is the same with that for combining letters into words that a few original ideas may be made to signify a great number of effects and actions it is necessary they be variously combined together and to the end their use be permanent and universal these combinations must be made by rule and with wise contrivance by this means abundance of information is conveyed unto us concerning what we are to expect from such and such actions and what methods are proper to be taken for the exciting such and such ideas which in effect is all that i conceive to be distinctly meant when it is said that by discerning a figure texture and mechanism of the inward parts of bodies whether natural or artificial we may attain to know the several uses and properties depending thereon or the nature of the thing sixty six proper employment of the natural philosopher hence it is evident that those things which under the notion of a cause cooperating or concurring to the production of effects are altogether inexplicable and run us into great absurdities may be very naturally explained and have a proper and obvious use assigned to them when they are considered only as marks or signs for our information and it is the searching after and endeavouring to understand those signs instituted by the author of nature that ought to be the employment of the natural philosopher and not the pretending to explain things by corporeal causes which doctrine seems to have too much estranged the minds of men from that active principle that supreme and wise spirit in whom we live move and have our being sixty seven twelfth objection answer in the twelfth place it may perhaps be objected that though it be clear from what has been said that there can be no such thing as an inert senseless extended solid figured movable substance existing without the mind such as philosophers describe matter yet if any man shall leave out of his idea of matter the positive ideas of extension figure solidity and motion and say that he means only by that word an inert senseless substance that exists without the mind or unperceived which is the occasion of our ideas or at the presence whereof god is pleased to excite ideas in us it doth not appear but that matter taken in this sense may possibly exist in answer to which i say first that it seems no less absurd to suppose a substance without accidents than it is to suppose accidents without a substance but secondly though we should grant this unknown substance may possibly exist yet where can it be supposed to be that it exists not in the mind is agreed and that it exists not in place is no less certain since all place or extension exists only in the mind as has been already proved it remains therefore that it exists nowhere at all sixty eight matter supports nothing an argument against its existence let us examine a little the description that is here given us of matter it neither acts nor perceives nor is perceived for this is all that is meant by saying it is an inert senseless unknown substance which is a definition entirely made up of negatives excepting only the relative notion of its standing under or supporting but then it must be observed that it supports nothing at all and how nearly this comes to the description of a nonentity i desire may be considered but say you it is the unknown occasion at the presence of which ideas are excited in us by the will of god now i would fain know how anything can be present to us which is neither perceivable by sense nor reflection nor capable of producing any idea in our minds nor is at all extended nor has any form nor exists in any place the words to be present when thus applied must needs be taken in some abstract and strange meaning and which i am not able to comprehend sixty nine again let us examine what is meant by occasion so far as i can gather from the common use of language that word signifies either the agent which produces any effect or else something that is observed to accompany or go before it in the ordinary course of things but when it is applied to matter as above described it can be taken in neither of those senses for matter is said to be passive and inert and so cannot be an agent or efficient cause it is also unperceivable as being devoid of all sensible qualities and so cannot be the occasion of our perceptions in the latter sense as when the burning my finger is said to be the occasion of the pain that attends it what therefore can be meant by calling matter an occasion the term is either used in no sense at all 
or else in some very distant from its received signification seventy you will perhaps say that matter though it be not perceived by us is nevertheless perceived by god to whom it is the occasion of exciting ideas in our minds for say you since we observe our sensations to be imprinted in an orderly and constant manner it is but reasonable to suppose there are certain constant and regular occasions of their being produced that is to say that there are certain permanent and distinct parcels of matter corresponding to our ideas which though they do not excite them in our minds or anywise immediately affect us as being altogether passive and unperceivable to us they are nevertheless to god by whom they are perceived as it were so many occasions to remind him when and what ideas to imprint on our minds that so things may go on in a constant uniform manner seventy one in answer to this i observe that as the notion of matter is here stated the question is no longer concerning the existence of a thing distinct from spirit and idea from perceiving and being perceived but whether there are not certain ideas of i know not what sort in the mind of god which are so many marks or notes that direct him how to produce sensations in our minds in a constant and regular method much after the same manner as a musician is directed by the notes of music to produce that harmonious train and composition of sound which is called a tune though they who hear the music do not perceive the notes and may be entirely ignorant of them but this notion of matter seems too extravagant to deserve a confutation besides it is in effect no objection against what we have advanced namely that there is no senseless unperceived substance seventy two the order of our perceptions shows the goodness of god but affords no proof of the existence of matter if we follow the light of reason we shall from the constant uniform method of our sensations collect the goodness and wisdom of the spirit who excites them in our minds but this is all that i can see reasonably concluded from thence to me i say it is evident that the being of a spirit infinitely wise good and powerful is abundantly sufficient to explain all the appearances of nature but as for inert senseless matter nothing that i perceive has any the least connection with it or leads to the thoughts of it and i would fain see any one explain any the meanest phenomenon in nature by it or show any manner of reason though in the lowest rank of probability that he can have for its existence or even make any tolerable sense or meaning of that supposition for as to its being an occasion we have i think evidently shown that with regard to us it is no occasion it remains therefore that it must be if at all the occasion to god of exciting ideas in us and what this amounts to we have just now seen seventy three it is worth while to reflect a little on the motives which induced men to suppose the existence of material substance that so having observed the gradual ceasing and expiration of those motives or reasons we may proportionably withdraw the assent that was grounded on them first therefore it was thought that colour figure motion and the rest of the sensible qualities or accidents did really exist without the mind and for this reason it seemed needful to suppose some unthinking substratum or substance wherein they did exist since they could not be conceived to exist by themselves afterwards in process of time men being convinced that colours sounds and the rest of the sensible secondary qualities had no existence without the mind they stripped this substratum or material substance of those qualities leaving only the primary ones figure motion and such like which they still conceived to exist without the mind and consequently to stand in need of a material support but it having been shown that none even of these can possibly exist otherwise than in a spirit or mind which perceives them it follows that we have no longer any reason to suppose the being of matter nay that it is utterly impossible there should be any such thing so long as that word is taken to denote an unthinking substratum of qualities or accidents wherein they exist without the mind seventy four but though it be allowed by the materialists themselves that matter was thought of only for the sake of supporting accidents and the reason entirely ceasing one might expect the mind should naturally and without any reluctance at all quit the belief of what was solely grounded thereon yet the prejudice is riveted so deeply in our thoughts that we can scarce tell how to part with it and are therefore inclined since the thing itself is indefensible at least to retain the name which we apply to i know not what abstracted and indefinite notions of being or occasion though without any show of reason at least so far as i can see 
for what is there on our part or what do we perceive amongst all the ideas sensations notions which are imprinted on our minds either by sense or reflection from whence may be inferred the existence of an inert thoughtless unperceived occasion and on the other hand on the part of an all-sufficient spirit what can there be that should make us believe or even suspect he is directed by an inert occasion to excite ideas in our minds seventy five absurdity of contending for the existence of matter as the occasion of ideas it is a very extraordinary instance of the force of prejudice and much to be lamented that the mind of man retains so great a fondness against all the evidence of reason for a stupid thoughtless somewhat by the interposition whereof it would as it were screen itself from the providence of god and remove it farther off from the affairs of the world but though we do the utmost we can to secure the belief of matter though when reason forsakes us we endeavour to support our opinion on the bare possibility of the thing and though we indulge ourselves in the full scope of an imagination not regulated by reason to make out that poor possibility yet the upshot of all is that there are certain unknown ideas in the mind of god for this if anything is all that i conceive to be meant by occasion with regard to god and this at the bottom is no longer contending for the thing but for the name seventy six whether therefore there are such ideas in the mind of god and whether they may be called by the name matter i shall not dispute but if you stick to the notion of an unthinking substance or support of extension motion and other sensible qualities then to me it is most evidently impossible there should be any such thing since it is a plain repugnancy that those qualities should exist in or be supported by an unperceiving substance seventy seven that a substratum not perceived may exist unimportant but say you though it be granted that there is no thoughtless support of extension and the other qualities or accidents which we perceive yet there may perhaps be some inert unperceiving substance or substratum of some other qualities as incomprehensible to us as colours are to a man born blind because we have not a sense adapted to them but if we had a new sense we should possibly no more doubt of their existence than a blind man made to see does of the existence of light and colours i answer first if what you mean by the word matter be only the unknown support of unknown qualities it is no matter whether there is such a thing or no since it no way concerns us and i do not see the advantage there is in disputing about what we know not what and we know not why seventy eight but secondly if we had a new sense it could only furnish us with new ideas or sensations and then we should have the same reason against their existing in an unperceiving substance that has been already offered with relation to figure motion colour and the like qualities as has been shown are nothing else but sensations or ideas which exist only in a mind perceiving them and this is true not only of the ideas we are acquainted with at present but likewise of all possible ideas whatsoever End of section four. Section five of a treatise concerning the principles of human knowledge by George Barclay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the principles of human knowledge, continued. Seventy nine. But you will insist, what if I have no reason to believe the existence of matter? What if I cannot assign any use to it or explain anything by it? or even conceive what is meant by that word yet still it is no contradiction to say that matter exists and that this matter is in general a substance or occasion of ideas though indeed to go about to unfold the meaning or adhere to any particular explication of those words may be attended with great difficulties i answer when words are used without a meaning you may put them together as you please without danger of running into a contradiction you may say for example that twice two is equal to seven so long as you declare that you do not take the words of that proposition in their usual acceptation but for marks of you know not what and by the same reason you may say there is an inert thoughtless substance without accidents which is the occasion of our ideas and we shall understand just as much by one proposition as the other eighty in the last place you will say what if we give up the cause of material substance and stand to it that matter is an unknown somewhat neither substance nor accident spirit nor idea inert thoughtless indivisible immovable unextended existing in no place 
for say you whatever may be urged against substance or occasion or any other positive or relative notion of matter has no place at all so long as this negative definition of matter is adhered to i answer you may if so it shall seem good use the word matter in the same sense as other men use nothing and so make those terms convertible in your style for after all this is what appears to me to be the result of that definition the parts whereof when i consider with attention either collectively or separate from each other i do not find that there is any kind of effect or impression made on my mind different from what is excited by the term nothing eighty one you will reply perhaps that in the foresaid definition is included what doth sufficiently distinguish it from nothing the positive abstract idea of quiddity entity or existence i own indeed that those who pretend to the faculty of framing abstract general ideas do talk as if they had such an idea which is say they the most abstract and general notion of all that is to me the most incomprehensible of all others that there are a great variety of spirits of different orders and capacities whose faculties both in number and extent are far exceeding those the author of my being has bestowed on me i see no reason to deny and for me to pretend to determine by my own few stinted narrow inlets of perception what ideas the inexhaustible power of the supreme spirit may imprint upon them were certainly the utmost folly and presumption since there may be for aught that i know innumerable sorts of ideas or sensations as different from one another and from all that i have perceived as colours are from sounds but how ready soever i may be to acknowledge the scantiness of my comprehension with regard to the endless variety of spirits and ideas that may possibly exist yet for any one to pretend to a notion of entity or existence abstracted from spirit and idea from perceived and being perceived is i suspect a downright repugnancy and trifling with words it remains that we consider the objections which may possibly be made on the part of religion eighty two objections derived from the scriptures answered some there are who think that though the arguments for the real existence of bodies which are drawn from reason be allowed not to amount to demonstration yet the holy scriptures are so clear in the point as will sufficiently convince every good christian that bodies do really exist and are something more than mere ideas there being in holy writ innumerable facts related which evidently suppose the reality of timber and stone mountains and rivers and cities and human bodies to which i answer that no sort of writings whatever sacred or profane which use those and the like words in the vulgar acceptation or so as to have a meaning in them are in danger of having their truth called in question by our doctrine that all those things do really exist that there are bodies even corporeal substances when taken in the vulgar sense has been shown to be agreeable to our principles and the difference betwixt things and ideas realities and chimeras has been distinctly explained see section twenty nine thirty thirty three thirty six etc and i do not think that either what philosophers call matter or the existence of objects without the mind is anywhere mentioned in scripture eighty three no objection as to language tenable again whether there can be or be not external things it is agreed on all hands that the proper use of words is the marking our conceptions or things only as they are known and perceived by us whence it plainly follows that in the tenets we have laid down there is nothing inconsistent with the right use and significancy of language and that discourse of what kind soever so far as it is intelligible remains undisturbed but all this seems so manifest from what has been largely set forth in the premises that it is needless to insist any farther on it eighty four but secondly it will be urged that miracles do at least lose much of their stress and import by our principles what must we think of moses's rod was it not really turned into a serpent or was there only a change of ideas in the minds of the spectators and can it be supposed that our saviour did no more at the marriage feast in cana than impose on the sight and smell and taste of the guests so as to create in them the appearance or idea only of wine the same may be said of all other miracles which in consequence of the foregoing principles must be looked upon only as so many cheats or illusions of fancy to this i reply that the rod was changed into a real serpent and the water into real wine that this does not in the least contradict what i have elsewhere said will be evident from section thirty four and thirty five but this business of real and imaginary has been already so plainly and fully explained and so often referred to and the difficulties about it are so easily answered from what has gone before 
that it were an affront to the reader's understanding to resume the explication of it in its place i shall only observe that if at table all who were present should see and smell and taste and drink wine and find the effects of it with me there could be no doubt of its reality so that at bottom the scruple concerning real miracles has no place at all on ours but only on the received principles and consequently makes rather for than against what has been said eighty five consequences of the preceding tenets having done with the objections which i endeavoured to propose in the clearest light and gave them all the force and weight i could we proceed in the next place to take a view of our tenets in their consequences some of these appear at first sight as that several difficult and obscure questions on which abundance of speculation has been thrown away are entirely banished from philosophy whether corporeal substance can think whether matter be infinitely divisible and how it operates on spirit these and like inquiries have given infinite amusement to philosophers in all ages but depending on the existence of matter they have no longer any place on our principles many other advantages there are as well with regard to religion as the sciences which it is easy for any one to deduce from what has been premised but this will appear more plainly in the sequel eighty six the removal of matter gives certainty to knowledge from the principles we have laid down it follows human knowledge may naturally be reduced to two heads that of ideas and that of spirits of each of these i shall treat in order and first as to ideas or unthinking things our knowledge of these has been very much obscured and confounded and we have been led into very dangerous errors by supposing a twofold existence of the objects of sense the one intelligible or in the mind the other real and without the mind whereby unthinking things are thought to have a natural subsistence of their own distinct from being perceived by spirits this which if i mistake not has been shown to be a most groundless and absurd notion is the very root of scepticism for so long as men thought that real things subsisted without the mind and that their knowledge was only so far forth real as it was conformable to real things it follows they could not be certain they had any real knowledge at all for how can it be known that the things which are perceived are conformable to those which are not perceived or exist without the mind eighty seven colour figure motion extension and the like considered only as so many sensations in the mind are perfectly known there being nothing in them which is not perceived but if they are looked on as notes or images referred to things or archetypes existing without the mind then we are involved all in scepticism we see only the appearances and not the real qualities of things what may be the extension figure or motion of anything really and absolutely or in itself it is impossible for us to know but only the proportion or relation they bear to our senses things remaining the same our ideas vary and which of them or even whether any of them at all represent the true quality really existing in the thing it is out of our reach to determine so that for aught we know all we see hear and feel may be only phantom and vain chimera and not at all agree with the real things existing in rerum natura all this scepticism follows from our supposing a difference between things and ideas and that the former have a subsistence without the mind or unperceived it were easy to dilate on this subject and show how the arguments urged by sceptics in all ages depend on the supposition of external objects eighty eight if there be external matter neither the nature nor existence of things can be known so long as we attribute a real existence to unthinking things distinct from their being perceived it is not only impossible for us to know with evidence the nature of any real unthinking being but even that it exists hence it is that we see philosophers distrust their senses and doubt of the existence of heaven and earth of everything they see or feel even of their own bodies and after all their labour and struggle of thought they are forced to own we cannot attain to any self-evident or demonstrative knowledge of the existence of sensible things but all this doubtfulness which so bewilders and confounds the mind and makes philosophy ridiculous in the eyes of the world vanishes if we annex a meaning to our words and not amuse ourselves with the terms absolute external exist and such like signifying we know not what i can as well doubt of my own being as of the being of those things which i actually perceive by sense it being a manifest contradiction that any sensible object should be immediately perceived by sight or touch and at the same time have no existence in nature since the very existence of an unthinking being consists in being perceived eighty nine 
of thing or being nothing seems of more importance towards erecting a firm system of sound and real knowledge which may be proof against the assaults of scepticism than to lay the beginning in a distinct explication of what is meant by thing reality existence for in vain shall we dispute concerning the real existence of things or pretend to any knowledge thereof so long as we have not fixed the meaning of those words thing or being is the most general name of all it comprehends under it two kinds entirely distinct and heterogeneous and which have nothing common but the name namely spirits and ideas the former are active indivisible substances the latter are inert fleeting dependent beings which subsist not by themselves but are supported by or exist in minds or spiritual substances we comprehend our own existence by inward feeling or reflection and that of other spirits by reason we may be said to have some knowledge or notion of our own minds of spirits and active beings whereof in a strict sense we have not ideas in like manner we know and have a notion of relations between things or ideas which relations are distinct from the ideas or things related inasmuch as the latter may be perceived by us without our perceiving the former to me it seems that ideas spirits and relations are all in their respective kinds the object of human knowledge and subject of discourse and that the term idea would be improperly extended to signify everything we know or have any notion of ninety external things either imprinted by or perceived by some other mind ideas imprinted on the senses are real things or do really exist this we do not deny but we deny they can subsist without the minds which perceive them or that they are resemblances of any archetypes existing without the mind since the very being of a sensation or idea consists in being perceived and an idea can be like nothing but an idea again the things perceived by sense may be termed external with regard to their origin in that they are not generated from within by the mind itself but imprinted by a spirit distinct from that which perceives them sensible objects may likewise be said to be without the mind in another sense namely when they exist in some other mind thus when i shut my eyes the things i saw may still exist but it must be in another mind ninety one sensible qualities real it were a mistake to think that what is here said derogates in the least from the reality of things it is acknowledged on the received principles that extension motion and in a word all sensible qualities have need of a support as not being able to subsist by themselves but the objects perceived by sense are allowed to be nothing but combinations of those qualities and consequently cannot subsist by themselves thus far it is agreed on all hand so that in denying the things perceived by sense an existence independent of a substance of support wherein they may exist we detract nothing from the received opinion of their reality and are guilty of no innovation in that respect all the difference is that according to us the unthinking beings perceived by sense have no existence distinct from being perceived and cannot therefore exist in any other substance than those unextended indivisible substances or spirits which act and think and perceive them whereas philosophers vulgarly hold that the sensible qualities do exist in an inert extended unperceiving substance which they call matter to which they attribute a natural subsistence exterior to all thinking beings or distinct from being perceived by any mind whatsoever even the eternal mind of the creator wherein they suppose only ideas of the corporeal substances created by him if indeed they allow them to be at all created ninety two objections of atheists overturned for as we have shown the doctrine of matter or corporeal substance to have been the main pillar and support of scepticism so likewise upon the same foundation have been raised all the impious schemes of atheism and irreligion nay so great a difficulty has it been thought to conceive matter produced out of nothing that the most celebrated among the ancient philosophers even of those who maintained the being of a god have thought matter to be uncreated and co-eternal with him how great a friend material substance has been to atheists in all ages were needless to relate all their monstrous systems have so visible and necessary a dependence on it that when this cornerstone is once removed the whole fabric cannot choose but fall to the ground insomuch that it is no longer worth while to bestow a particular consideration on the absurdities of every wretched sect of atheists ninety three and of fatalists also that impious and profane persons should readily fall in with those systems which favour their inclinations by deriding immaterial substance and supposing the soul to be divisible and subject to corruption as the body 
which exclude all freedom intelligence and design from the formation of things and instead thereof make a self-existent stupid unthinking substance the root and origin of all beings that they should hearken to those who deny a providence or inspection of a superior mind over the affairs of the world attributing the whole series of events either to blind chance or fatal necessity arising from the impulse of one body or another all this is very natural and on the other hand when men of better principles observe the enemies of religion lay so great a stress on unthinking matter and all of them use so much industry and artifice to reduce everything to it methinks they should rejoice to see them deprived of their grand support and driven from that only fortress without which your epicureans hobbists and the like have not even the shadow of a pretence but become the most cheap and easy triumph in the world ninety four of idolaters the existence of matter or bodies unperceived has not only been the main support of atheists and fatalists but on the same principle doth idolatry likewise in all its various forms depend did men but consider that the sun moon and stars and every other object of the senses are only so many sensations in their minds which have no other existence but barely being perceived doubtless they would never fall down and worship their own ideas but rather address their homage to that eternal invisible mind which produces and sustains all things ninety five and Socinians. the same absurd principle by mingling itself with the articles of our faith has occasioned no small difficulties to christians for example about the resurrection how many scruples and objections have been raised by Socinians and others but do not the most plausible of them depend on the supposition that a body is denominated the same with regard not to the form or that which is perceived by sense but the material substance which remains the same under several forms take away this material substance about the identity whereof all the dispute is and mean by body what every plain ordinary person means by that word to wit that which is immediately seen and felt which is only a combination of sensible qualities or ideas and then their most unanswerable objections come to nothing ninety six summary of the consequences of expelling matter matter being once expelled out of nature drags with it so many sceptical and impious notions such an incredible number of disputes and puzzling questions which have been thorns in the sides of divines as well as philosophers and made so much fruitless work for mankind that if the arguments we have produced against it are not found equal to demonstration as to me they evidently seem yet i am sure all friends to knowledge peace and religion have reason to wish they were ninety seven beside the external existence of the objects of perception another great source of errors and difficulties with regard to ideal knowledge is the doctrine of abstract ideas such as it has been set forth in the introduction the plainest things in the world those we are most intimately acquainted with and perfectly know when they are considered in an abstract way appear strangely difficult and incomprehensible time place and motion taken in particular or concrete are what everybody knows but having passed through the hands of a metaphysician they become too abstract and fine to be apprehended by men of ordinary sense bid your servant meet you at such a time in such a place and he shall never stay to deliberate on the meaning of those words in conceiving that particular time and place or the motion by which he is to get thither he finds not the least difficulty but if time be taken exclusive of all those particular actions and ideas that diversify the day merely for the continuation of existence or duration in abstract then it will perhaps gravel even a philosopher to comprehend it ninety eight dilemma for my own part whenever i attempt to frame a simple idea of time abstracted from the succession of ideas in my mind which flows uniformly and is participated by all beings i am lost and embrangled in inextricable difficulties i have no notion of it at all only i hear others say it is infinitely divisible and speak of it in such a manner as leads me to entertain odd thoughts of my existence since that doctrine lays one under an absolute necessity of thinking either that he passes away innumerable ages without a thought or else that he is annihilated every moment of his life both which seem equally absurd time therefore being nothing abstracted from the succession of ideas in our minds it follows that the duration of any finite spirit must be estimated by the number of ideas or actions succeeding each other in that same spirit or mind hence it is a plain consequence that the soul always thinks and in truth whoever shall go about to divide in his thoughts or abstract the existence of a spirit from its cogitation will i believe find it no easy task ninety nine 
so likewise when we attempt to abstract extension and motion from all other qualities and to consider them by themselves we presently lose sight of them and run into great extravagances all which depend on a twofold abstraction first it is supposed that extension for example may be abstracted from all other sensible qualities and secondly that the entity of extension may be abstracted from its being perceived but whoever shall reflect and take care to understand what he says will if i mistake not acknowledge that all sensible qualities are alike sensations and alike real that where the extension is there is the colour too that is in his mind and that their archetypes can exist only in some other mind and that the objects of sense are nothing but those sensations combined blended or if one may so speak concreted together none of all which can be supposed to exist unperceived one hundred what it is for a man to be happy or an object good every one may think he knows but to frame an abstract idea of happiness prescinded from all particular pleasure or of goodness from everything that is good this is what few can pretend to so likewise a man may be just and virtuous without having precise ideas of justice and virtue the opinion that those and the like words stand for general notions abstracted from all particular persons and actions seems to have rendered morality very difficult and the study thereof of small use to mankind and in effect the doctrine of abstraction has not a little contributed towards spoiling the most useful parts of knowledge 101 of natural philosophy and mathematics the two great provinces of speculative science conversant about ideas received from sense are natural philosophy and mathematics with regard to each of these i shall make some observations and first i shall say somewhat of natural philosophy on this subject it is that the sceptics triumph all that stock of arguments they produce to depreciate our faculties and to make mankind appear ignorant and low are drawn principally from this head namely that we are under an invincible blindness as to the true and real nature of things this they exaggerate and love to enlarge on we are miserably bantered say they by our senses and amused only with the outside and show of things the real essence the internal qualities and constitution of every the meanest object is hid from our view something there is in every drop of water every grain of sand which it is beyond the power of human understanding to fathom or comprehend but it is evident from what has been shown that all this complaint is groundless and that we are influenced by false principles to that degree as to mistrust our senses and think we know nothing of those things which we perfectly comprehend 102 one great inducement to our pronouncing ourselves ignorant of the nature of things is the current opinion that everything includes within itself the cause of its properties or that there is in each object an inward essence which is the source whence its discernible qualities flow and whereon they depend some have pretended to account for appearances by occult qualities but of late they are mostly resolved into mechanical causes to wit the figure motion weight and such like qualities of insensible particles whereas in truth there is no other agent or efficient cause than spirit it being evident that motion as well as all other ideas is perfectly inert see section twenty five hence to endeavour to explain the production of colours or sounds by figure motion magnitude and the like must needs be labour in vain and accordingly we see the attempts of that kind are not at all satisfactory which may be said in general of those instances wherein one idea or quality is assigned for the cause of another i need not say how many hypotheses and speculations are left out and how much the study of nature is abridged by this doctrine One hundred and three attraction signifies the effect not the manner or cause the great mechanical principle now in vogue is attraction that a stone falls to the earth or the sea swells towards the moon may to some appear sufficiently explained thereby but how are we enlightened by being told this is done by attraction is it that that word signifies the manner of the tendency and that it is by the mutual drawing of bodies instead of their being impelled or protruded towards each other but nothing is determined of the manner or action and it may as truly for aught we know be termed impulse or protrusion as attraction again the parts of steel we see cohere firmly together and this also is accounted for by attraction but in this as in the other instances i do not perceive that anything is signified besides the effect itself for as to the manner of the action whereby it is produced or the cause which produces it these are not so much as aimed at 104 
indeed if we take a view of the several phenomena and compare them together we may observe some likeness and conformity between them for example in the falling of a stone to the ground in the rising of the sea towards the moon in cohesion crystallization etc there is something alike namely an union or mutual approach of bodies so that any one of these or the like phenomena may not seem strange or surprising to a man who has nicely observed and compared the effects of nature for that only is thought so which is uncommon or a thing by itself and out of the ordinary course of our observation that bodies should tend towards the centre of the earth is not thought strange because it is what we perceive every moment of our lives but that they should have a like gravitation towards the centre of the moon may seem odd and unaccountable to most men because it is discerned only in the tides but a philosopher whose thoughts take in a larger compass of nature having observed a certain similitude of appearances as well in the heavens as the earth that argue innumerable bodies to have a mutual tendency towards each other which he denotes by the general name attraction whatever can be reduced to that he thinks justly accounted for thus he explains the tides by the attraction of the terraqueous globe towards the moon which to him does not appear odd or anomalous but only a particular example of a general rule or law of nature 105 if therefore we consider the difference there is betwixt natural philosophers and other men with regard to their knowledge of the phenomena we shall find it consists not in an exacter knowledge of the efficient cause that produces them for that can be no other than the will of a spirit but only in a greater largeness of comprehension whereby analogies harmonies and agreements are discovered in the works of nature and the particular effects explained that is reduced to general rules see section sixty two which rules grounded on the analogy and uniformness observed in the production of natural effects are most agreeable and sought after by the mind for that they extend our prospect beyond what is present and near to us and enable us to make very probable conjectures touching things that may have happened at very great distances of time and place as well as to predict things to come which sort of endeavour towards omniscience is much affected by the mind End of section five. Section six of a treatise concerning the principles of human knowledge by George Berkeley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the principles of human knowledge continued. One hundred and six. Caution as to the use of analogies. But we should proceed warily in such things, for we are apt to lay too great stress on analogies, and to the prejudice of truth humour that eagerness of the mind whereby it is carried to extend its knowledge into general theorems for example in the business of gravitation or mutual attraction because it appears in many instances some are straightway for pronouncing it universal and that to attract and be attracted by every other body is an essential quality inherent in all bodies whatsoever whereas it is evident the fixed stars have no such tendency towards each other and so far is that gravitation from being essential to bodies that in some instances a quite contrary principle seems to show itself as in the perpendicular growth of plants and the elasticity of the air there is nothing necessary or essential in the case but it depends entirely on the will of the governing spirit who causes certain bodies to cleave together or tend towards each other according to various laws whilst he keeps others at a fixed distance and to some he gives a quite contrary tendency to fly asunder just as he sees convenient 107 after what has been premised i think we may lay down the following conclusions first it is plain philosophers amuse themselves in vain when they inquire for any natural efficient cause distinct from a mind or spirit secondly considering the whole creation is the workmanship of a wise and good agent it should seem to become philosophers to employ their thoughts contrary to what some hold about the final causes of things and i confess i see no reason why pointing out the various ends to which natural things are adapted and for which they were originally with unspeakable wisdom contrived should not be thought one good way of accounting for them and altogether worthy a philosopher thirdly from what has been premised no reason can be drawn why the history of nature should not still be studied and observations and experiments made which that they are of use to mankind and enable us to draw any general conclusions is not the result of any immutable habitudes or relations between things themselves but only of god's goodness and kindness to men in the administration of the world see section thirty and thirty one fourthly by a diligent observation of the phenomena within our view we may discover the general laws of nature and from them deduce the other phenomena 
i do not say demonstrate for all deductions of that kind depend on a supposition that the author of nature always operates uniformly and in a constant observance of those rules we take for principles which we cannot evidently know 108 three analogies those men who frame general rules from the phenomena and afterwards derive the phenomena from those rules seem to consider signs rather than causes a man may well understand natural signs without knowing their analogy or being able to say by what rule a thing is so or so and as it is very possible to write improperly through too strict an observance of general grammar rules so in arguing from general laws of nature it is not impossible we may extend the analogy too far and by that means run into mistakes 109 as in reading other books a wise man will choose to fix his thoughts on the sense and apply it to use rather than lay them out in grammatical remarks on the language so in perusing the volume of nature it seems beneath the dignity of the mind to affect an exactness in reducing each particular phenomenon to general rules or showing how it follows from them we should propose to ourselves nobler views namely to recreate and exalt the mind with a prospect of the beauty order extent and variety of natural things hence by proper inferences to enlarge our notions of the grandeur wisdom and beneficence of the creator and lastly to make the several parts of the creation so far as in us lies subservient to the ends they were designed for god's glory and the sustentation and comfort of ourselves and fellow creatures 110 the best key for the aforesaid analogy or natural science will be easily acknowledged to be a certain celebrated treatise of mechanics in the entrance of which justly admired treatise time space and motion are distinguished into absolute and relative true and apparent mathematical and vulgar which distinction as it is at large explained by the author does suppose these quantities to have an existence without the mind and that they are ordinarily conceived with relation to sensible things to which nevertheless in their own nature they bear no relation at all 111 as for time as it is there taken in an absolute or abstracted sense for the duration or perseverance of the existence of things i have nothing more to add concerning it after what has been already said on that subject section ninety seven and ninety eight for the rest this celebrated author holds there is an absolute space which being unperceivable to sense remains in itself similar and immovable and relative space to be the measure thereof which being movable and defined by its situation in respect of sensible bodies is vulgarly taken for immovable space place he defines to be that part of space which is occupied by any body and according as the space is absolute or relative so also is the place absolute motion is said to be the translation of a body from absolute place to absolute place as relative motion is from one relative place to another and because the parts of absolute space do not fall under our senses instead of them we are obliged to use their sensible measures and so define both place and motion with respect to bodies which we regard as immovable but it is said in philosophical matters we must abstract from our senses since it may be that none of those bodies which seem to be quiescent are truly so and the same thing which is moved relatively may be really at rest as likewise one and the same body may be in relative rest and motion or even moved with contrary relative motions at the same time according as its place is variously defined all which ambiguity is to be found in the apparent motions but not at all in the true or absolute which should therefore be alone regarded in philosophy and the true as we are told are distinguished from apparent or relative motions by the following properties first in true or absolute motion all parts which preserve the same position with respect of the whole partake of the motions of the whole secondly the place being moved that which is placed therein is also moved so that a body moving in a place which is in motion doth participate the motion of its place thirdly true motion is never generated or changed otherwise than by force impressed on the body itself fourthly true motion is always changed by force impressed on the body moved fifthly in circular motion barely relative there is no centrifugal force which nevertheless in that which is true or absolute is proportional to the quantity of motion 112 motion whether real or apparent relative but notwithstanding what has been said i must confess it does not appear to me that there can be any motion other than relative so that to conceive motion there must be at least conceived two bodies whereof the distance or position in regard to each other is varied 
hence if there was one only body in being it could not possibly be moved this seems evident in that the idea i have of motion doth necessarily include relation 113 apparent motion denied but though in every motion it be necessary to conceive more bodies than one yet it may be that one only is moved namely that on which the force causing the change in the distance or situation of the bodies is impressed for however some may define relative motion so as to term that body moved which changes its distance from some other body whether the force or action causing that change were impressed on it or no yet as relative motion is that which is perceived by sense and regarded in the ordinary affairs of life it should seem that every man of common sense knows what it is as well as the best philosopher now i ask any one whether in his sense of motion as he walks along the streets the stones he passes over may be said to move because they change distance with his feet to me it appears that though motion includes a relation of one thing to another yet it is not necessary that each term of the relation be denominated from it as a man may think of somewhat which does not think so a body may be moved to or from another body which is not therefore itself in motion 114 as the place happens to be variously defined the motion which is related to it varies a man in a ship may be said to be quiescent with relation to the sides of the vessel and yet move with relation to the land or he may move eastward in respect of the one and westward in respect of the other in the common affairs of life men never go beyond the earth to define the place of any body and what is quiescent in respect of that is accounted absolutely to be so but philosophers who have a greater extent of thought and juster notions of the system of things discover even the earth itself to be moved in order therefore to fix their notions they seem to conceive the corporeal world as finite and the utmost unmoved walls or shell thereof to be the place whereby they estimate true motions if we sound our own conceptions i believe we may find all the absolute motion we can frame an idea of to be at bottom no other than relative motion thus defined for as has been already observed absolute motion exclusive of all external relation is incomprehensible and to this kind of relative motion all the above-mentioned properties causes and effects ascribed to absolute motion will if i mistake not be found to agree as to what is said of the centrifugal force that it does not at all belong to circular relative motion i do not see how this follows from the experiment which is brought to prove it si philosophiae naturalis principia mathematica in scoldef eight for the water in the vessel at the same time wherein it is said to have the greatest relative circular motion has i think no motion at all as is plain from the foregoing section one hundred and fifteen for to denominate a body moved it is requisite first that it change its distance or situation with regard to some other body and secondly that the force occasioning that change be applied to it if either of these be wanting i do not think that agreeably to the sense of mankind or the propriety of language a body can be said to be in motion i grant indeed that it is possible for us to think a body which we see change its distance from some other to be moved though it have no force applied to it in which sense there may be apparent motion but then it is because the force causing the change of distance is imagined by us to be applied or impressed on that body thought to move which indeed shows we are capable of mistaking a thing to be in motion which is not and that is all one hundred and sixteen any idea of pure space relative from what has been said it follows that the philosophic consideration of motion does not imply the being of an absolute space distinct from that which is perceived by sense and related bodies which that it cannot exist without the mind is clear upon the same principles that demonstrate the like of all other objects of sense and perhaps if we inquire narrowly we shall find we cannot even frame an idea of pure space exclusive of all body this i must confess seems impossible as being a most abstract idea when i excite a motion in some part of my body if it be free or without resistance i say there is space but if i find a resistance then i say there is body and in proportion as the resistance to motion is lesser or greater i say the space is more or less pure so that when i speak of pure or empty space it is not to be supposed that the word space stands for an idea distinct from or conceivable without body and motion though indeed we are apt to think every noun substantive stands for a distinct idea that may be separated from all others which has occasioned infinite mistakes when therefore supposing all the world to be annihilated besides my own body 
i say there still remains pure space thereby nothing else is meant but only that i conceive it possible for the limbs of my body to be moved on all sides without the least resistance but if that too were annihilated then there could be no motion and consequently no space some perhaps may think the sense of seeing doth furnish them with the idea of pure space but it is plain from what we have elsewhere shown that the ideas of space and distance are not obtained by that sense see the essay concerning vision 117 what is here laid down seems to put an end to all those disputes and difficulties that have sprung up amongst the learned concerning the nature of pure space but the chief advantage arising from it is that we are freed from that dangerous dilemma to which several who have employed their thoughts on that subject imagine themselves reduced to wit of thinking either that real space is god or else that there is something beside god which is eternal uncreated infinite indivisible immutable both which may justly be thought pernicious and absurd notions it is certain that not a few divines as well as philosophers of great note have from the difficulty they found in conceiving either limits or annihilation of space concluded it must be divine and some of late have set themselves particularly to show the incommunicable attributes of god agree to it which doctrine how unworthy soever it may seem of the divine nature yet i do not see how we can get clear of it so long as we adhere to the received opinions 118 the errors arising from the doctrines of abstraction and external material existences influence mathematical reasonings hitherto of natural philosophy we come now to make some inquiry concerning that other great branch of speculative knowledge to wit mathematics these how celebrated soever they may be for their clearness and certainty of demonstration which is hardly anywhere else to be found cannot nevertheless be supposed altogether free from mistakes if in their principles there lurks some secret error which is common to the professors of those sciences with the rest of mankind mathematicians though they deduce their theorems from a great height of evidence yet their first principles are limited by the consideration of quantity and they do not ascend into any inquiry concerning those transcendental maxims which influence all the particular sciences each part whereof mathematics not excepted does consequently participate of the errors involved in them that the principles laid down by mathematicians are true and their way of deduction from those principles clear and incontestable we do not deny but we hold there may be certain erroneous maxims of greater extent than the object of mathematics and for that reason not expressly mentioned though tacitly supposed throughout the whole progress of that science and that the ill effects of those secret unexamined errors are diffused through all the branches thereof to be plain we suspect the mathematicians are as well as other men concerned in the errors arising from the doctrine of abstract general ideas and the existence of objects without the mind 119 arithmetic has been thought to have for its object abstract ideas of number of which to understand the properties and mutual habitudes is supposed no mean part of speculative knowledge the opinion of the pure and intellectual nature of numbers in abstract has made them in esteem with those philosophers who seem to have affected an uncommon fineness and elevation of thought it has set a price on the most trifling numerical speculations which in practice are of no use but serve only for amusement and has therefore so far infected the minds of some that they have dreamed of mighty mysteries involved in numbers and attempted the explication of natural things by them but if we inquire into our own thoughts and consider what has been premised we may perhaps entertain a low opinion of those high flights and abstractions and look on all inquiries about numbers only as so many difficiles nugae so far as they are not subservient to practice and promote the benefit of life 120 unity in abstract we have before considered in section 13 from which and what has been said in the introduction it plainly follows there is not any such idea but number being defined a collection of units we may conclude that if there be no such thing as unity or unit in abstract there are no ideas of number in abstract denoted by the numeral names and figures the theories therefore in arithmetic if they are abstracted from the names and figures as likewise from all use and practice as well as from the particular things numbered can be supposed to have nothing at all for their object hence we may see how entirely the science of numbers is subordinate to practice and how jejun and trifling it becomes when considered as a matter of mere speculation 121 however since there may be some who deluded by the specious show of discovering abstracted verities 
waste their time in arithmetical theorems and problems which have not any use it will not be amiss if we more fully consider and expose the vanity of that pretence and this will plainly appear by taking a view of arithmetic in its infancy and observing what it was that originally put men on the study of that science and to what scope they directed it it is natural to think that at first men for ease of memory and help of computation made use of counters or in writing of single strokes points or the like each whereof was made to signify an unit that is some one thing of whatever kind they had occasion to reckon afterwards they found out the more compendious ways of making one character stand in place of several strokes or points and lastly the notation of the arabians or indians came into use wherein by the repetition of a few characters or figures and varying the signification of each figure according to the place it obtains all numbers may be most aptly expressed which seems to have been done in imitation of language so that an exact analogy is observed betwixt the notation by figures and names the nine simple figures answering the nine first numeral names and places in the former corresponding to denominations in the latter and agreeably to those conditions of the simple and local value of figures were contrived methods of finding from the given figures or marks of the parts what figures and how placed are proper to denote the whole or vice versa and having found the sort figures the same rule or analogy being observed throughout it is easy to read them into words and so the number becomes perfectly known for then the number of any particular things is said to be known when we know the name of figures with their due arrangement that according to the standing analogy belong to them for these signs being known we can by the operations of arithmetic know the signs of any part of the particular sums signified by them and thus computing in signs because of the connection established betwixt them and the distinct multitudes of things whereof one is taken for an unit we may be able rightly to sum up divide and proportion the things themselves that we intend to number 122 in arithmetic therefore we regard not the things but the signs which nevertheless are not regarded for their own sake but because they direct us how to act with relation to things and dispose rightly of them now agreeably to what we have before observed of words in general section nineteen introduction it happens here likewise that abstract ideas are thought to be signified by numeral names or characters while they do not suggest ideas of particular things to our minds i shall not at present enter into a more particular dissertation on this subject but only observe that it is evident from what has been said those things which pass for abstract truths and theorems concerning numbers are in reality conversant about no object distinct from particular numeral things except only names and characters which originally came to be considered on no other account but their being signs or capable to represent aptly whatever particular things men had need to compute whence it follows that to study them for their own sake would be just as wise and to as good purpose as if a man neglecting the true use or original intention and subserviency of language should spend his time in impertinent criticisms upon words or reasonings and controversies purely verbal one hundred and twenty three from numbers we proceed to speak of extension which considered as relative is the object of geometry the infinite divisibility of finite extension though it is not expressly laid down either as an axiom or theorem in the elements of that science yet is throughout the same everywhere supposed and thought to have so inseparable and essential a connection with the principles and demonstrations in geometry that mathematicians never admit it into doubt or make the least question of it and as this notion is the source from whence do spring all those amusing geometrical paradoxes which have such a direct repugnancy to the plain common sense of mankind and are admitted with so much reluctance into a mind not yet debauched by learning so it is the principal occasion of all that nice and extreme subtlety which renders the study of mathematics so difficult and tedious hence if we can make it appear that no finite extension contains innumerable parts or is infinitely divisible it follows that we shall at once clear the science of geometry from a great number of difficulties and contradictions which have ever been esteemed a reproach to human reason and withal make the attainment thereof a business of much less time and pains than it hitherto has been one hundred and twenty four every particular finite extension which may possibly be the object of our thought is an idea existing only in the mind and consequently each part thereof must be perceived if therefore i cannot perceive innumerable parts in any finite extension that i consider it is certain they are not contained in it 
but it is evident that i cannot distinguish innumerable parts in any particular line surface or solid which i either perceive by sense or figure to myself in my mind wherefore i conclude they are not contained in it nothing can be plainer to me than that the extensions i have in view are no other than my own ideas and it is no less plain that i cannot resolve any one of my ideas into an infinite number of other ideas that is that they are not infinitely divisible if by finite extension be meant something distinct from a finite idea i declare i do not know what that is and so cannot affirm or deny anything of it but if the terms extension parts etc are taken in any sense conceivable that is for ideas then to say a finite quantity or extension consists of parts infinite in number is so manifest a contradiction that every one at first sight acknowledges it to be so and it is impossible it should ever gain the assent of any reasonable creature who is not brought to it by gentle and slow degrees as a converted gentile to the belief of transubstantiation ancient and rooted prejudices do often pass into principles and those propositions which once obtain the force and credit of a principle are not only themselves but likewise whatever is deducible from them thought privileged from all examination and there is no absurdity so gross which by this means the mind of man may not be prepared to swallow 125 he whose understanding is possessed with the doctrine of abstract general ideas may be persuaded that whatever be thought of the ideas of sense extension in abstract is infinitely divisible and one who thinks the objects of sense exist without the mind will perhaps in virtue thereof be brought to admit that a line but an inch long may contain innumerable parts really existing though too small to be discerned these errors are grafted as well in the minds of geometricians as of other men and have a like influence on their reasonings and it were no difficult thing to show how the arguments from geometry made use of to support the infinite divisibility of extension are bottomed on them at present we shall only observe in general whence it is the mathematicians are all so fond and tenacious of that doctrine 126 it has been observed in another place that the theorems and demonstrations in geometry are conversant about universal ideas section 15 introduction where it is explained in what sense this ought to be understood to wit the particular lines and figures included in the diagram are supposed to stand for innumerable others of different sizes or in other words the geometer considers them abstracting from their magnitude which does not imply that he forms an abstract idea but only that he cares not what the particular magnitude is whether great or small but looks on that as a thing different to the demonstration hence it follows that a line in the scheme but an inch long must be spoken of as though it contained ten thousand parts since it is regarded not in itself but as it is universal and it is universal only in its signification whereby it represents innumerable lines greater than itself in which may be distinguished ten thousand parts or more though there may not be above an inch in it after this manner the properties of the lines signified are by a very usual figure transferred to the sign and thence through mistake thought to appertain to it considered in its own nature one hundred and twenty seven because there is no number of parts so great but it is possible there may be a line containing more the inch line is said to contain parts more than any assignable number which is true not of the inch taken absolutely but only for the things signified by it but men not retaining that distinction in their thoughts slide into a belief that the small particular line described on paper contains in itself parts innumerable there is no such thing as the ten thousandth part of an inch but there is of a mile or diameter of the earth which may be signified by that inch when therefore i delineate a triangle on paper and take one side not above an inch for example in length to be the radius this i consider as divided into ten thousand or a hundred thousand parts or more for though the ten thousandth part of that line considered in itself is nothing at all and consequently may be neglected without an error or inconveniency yet these described lines being only marks standing for greater quantities whereof it may be the ten thousandth part is very considerable it follows that to prevent notable errors in practice the radius must be taken of ten thousand parts or more 128 lines which are infinitely divisible from what has been said the reason is plain why to the end any theorem become universal in its use it is necessary we speak of the lines described on paper as though they contained parts which really they do not in doing of which if we examine the matter thoroughly 
we shall perhaps discover that we cannot conceive an inch itself as consisting of or being divisible into a thousand parts but only some other line which is far greater than an inch and represented by it and that when we say a line is infinitely divisible we must mean a line which is infinitely great what we have here observed seems to be the chief cause why to suppose the infinite divisibility of finite extension has been thought necessary in geometry 129 the several absurdities and contradictions which flowed from this false principle might one would think have been esteemed so many demonstrations against it but by i know not what logic it is held that proofs a posteriori are not to be admitted against propositions relating to infinity as though it were not impossible even for an infinite mind to reconcile contradictions or as if anything absurd and repugnant could have a necessary connection with truth or flow from it but whoever considers the weakness of this pretence will think it was contrived on purpose to humour the laziness of the mind which had rather acquiesce in an indolent scepticism than be at the pains to go through with a severe examination of those principles it has ever embraced for true 130 of late the speculations about infinities have run so high and grown to such strange notions as have occasioned no small scruples and disputes among the geometers of the present age some there are of great note who not content with holding that finite lines may be divided into an infinite number of parts do yet farther maintain that each of those infinitesimals is itself subdivisible into an infinity of other parts or infinitesimals of a second order and so on ad infinitum these i say assert there are infinitesimals of infinitesimals of infinitesimals etc without ever coming to an end so that according to them an inch does not barely contain an infinite number of parts but an infinity of an infinity of an infinity ad infinitum of parts others there be who hold all orders of infinitesimals below the first to be nothing at all thinking it with good reason absurd to imagine there is any positive quantity or part of extension which though multiplied infinitely can never equal the smallest given extension and yet on the other hand it seems no less absurd to think the square cube or other power of a positive real root should itself be nothing at all which they who hold infinitesimals of the first order denying all of the subsequent orders are obliged to maintain end of section six Section 7 of A Treatise Concerning the Principles of Human Knowledge by George Barclay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Principles of Human Knowledge continued. 131. Objection of Mathematicians. Answer. Have we not therefore reason to conclude they are both in the wrong, and that there is in effect no such thing as parts infinitely small, or an infinite number of parts contained in any finite quantity? But you will say that if this doctrine obtains it will follow the very foundations of geometry are destroyed and those great men who have raised that science to so astonishing a height have been all the while building a castle in the air to this it may be replied that whatever is useful in geometry and promotes the benefit of human life does still remain firm and unshaken on our principles that science considered as practical will rather receive advantage than any prejudice from what has been said but to set this in a due light may be the proper business of another place for the rest though it should follow that some of the more intricate and subtle parts of speculative mathematics may be paired off without any prejudice to truth yet i do not see what damage will be thence derived to mankind on the contrary i think it were highly to be wished that men of great abilities and obstinate application would draw off their thoughts from those amusements and employ them in the study of such things as lie nearer the concerns of life or have a more direct influence on the manners 132 second objection of mathematicians answer if it be said that several theorems undoubtedly true are discovered by methods in which infinitesimals are made use of which could never have been if their existence included a contradiction in it i answer that upon a thorough examination it will not be found that in any instance it is necessary to make use of or conceive infinitesimal parts of finite lines or even quantities less than the minimum sensible nay it will be evident this is never done it being impossible One hundred and thirty three if the doctrine were only an hypothesis it should be respected for its consequences 
by what we have premised it is plain that very numerous and important errors have taken their rise from those false principles which were impugned in the foregoing parts of this treatise and the opposites of those erroneous tenets at the same time appear to be most fruitful principles from whence do flow innumerable consequences highly advantageous to true philosophy as well as to religion particularly matter or the absolute existence of corporeal objects has been shown to be that wherein the most avowed and pernicious enemies of all knowledge whether human or divine have ever placed their chief strength and confidence and surely if by distinguishing the real existence of unthinking things from their being perceived and allowing them a subsistence of their own out of the minds of spirits no one thing is explained in nature but on the contrary a great many inexplicable difficulties arise if the supposition of matter is barely precarious as not being grounded on so much as one single reason if its consequences cannot endure the light of examination and free inquiry but screen themselves under the dark and general pretence of infinites being incomprehensible if withal the removal of this matter be not attended with the least evil consequence if it be not even missed in the world but everything as well nay much easier conceived without it if lastly both sceptics and atheists are forever silenced upon supposing only spirits and ideas and this scheme of things is perfectly agreeable both to reason and religion methinks we may expect it should be admitted and firmly embraced though it were proposed only as an hypothesis and the existence of matter had been allowed possible which yet i think we have evidently demonstrated that it is not One hundred thirty four true it is that in consequence of the foregoing principles several disputes and speculations which are esteemed no mean parts of learning are rejected as useless but how great a prejudice soever against our notions this may give to those who have already been deeply engaged and make large advances in studies of that nature yet by others we hope it will not be thought any just ground of dislike to the principles and tenets herein laid down that they abridge the labour of study and make human sciences far more clear compendious and attainable than they were before 135 having dispatched what we intended to say concerning the knowledge of ideas the method we proposed leads us in the next place to treat of spirits with regard to which perhaps human knowledge is not so deficient as is vulgarly imagined the great reason that is assigned for our being thought ignorant of the nature of spirits is our not having an idea of it but surely it ought not to be looked on as a defect in a human understanding that it does not perceive the idea of spirit if it is manifestly impossible there should be any such idea and this if i mistake not has been demonstrated in section twenty seven to which i shall here add that a spirit has been shown to be the only substance or support wherein unthinking beings or ideas can exist but that this substance which supports or perceives ideas should itself be an idea or like an idea is evidently absurd 136 objection answer it will perhaps be said that we want a sense as some have imagined proper to know substances withal which if we had we might know our own soul as we do a triangle to this i answer that in case we had a new sense bestowed upon us we could only receive thereby some new sensations or ideas of sense but i believe nobody will say that what he means by the terms soul and substance is only some particular sort of idea or sensation we may therefore infer that all things duly considered it is not more reasonable to think our faculties defective in that they do not furnish us with an idea of spirit or active thinking substance than it would be if we should blame them for not being able to comprehend a round square 137 from the opinion that spirits are to be known after the manner of an idea or sensation have risen many absurd and heterodox tenets and much scepticism about the nature of the soul it is even probable that this opinion may have produced a doubt in some whether they had any soul at all distinct from their body since upon inquiry they could not find they had an idea of it that an idea which is inactive and the existence whereof consists in being perceived should be the image or likeness of an agent subsisting by itself seems to need no other refutation than barely attending to what is meant by those words but perhaps you will say that though an idea cannot resemble a spirit in its thinking acting or subsisting by itself yet it may in some other respects and it is not necessary that an idea or image be in all respects like the original 138 i answer if it does not in those mentioned it is impossible it should represent it in any other thing 
do but leave out the power of willing thinking and perceiving ideas and there remains nothing else wherein the idea can be like a spirit for by the word spirit we mean only that which thinks wills and perceives this and this alone constitutes the signification of the term if therefore it is impossible that any degree of those powers should be represented in an idea it is evident there can be no idea of a spirit 139 but it will be objected that if there is no idea signified by the terms soul spirit and substance they are wholly insignificant or have no meaning in them i answer those words do mean or signify a real thing which is neither an idea or like an idea but that which perceives ideas and wills and reasons about them what i am myself that which i denote by the term i is the same with what is meant by soul or spiritual substance if it be said that this is only quarrelling at a word and that since the immediate significations of other names are by common consent called ideas no reason can be assigned why that which is signified by the name spirit or soul may not partake in the same appellation i answer all the unthinking objects of the mind agree in that they are entirely passive and their existence consists only in being perceived whereas a soul or spirit is an active being whose existence consists not in being perceived but in perceiving ideas and thinking it is therefore necessary in order to prevent equivocation and confounding natures perfectly disagreeing and unlike that we distinguish between spirit and idea see section twenty seven hundred and forty our idea of spirit in a large sense indeed we may be said to have an idea or rather a notion of spirit that is we understand the meaning of the word otherwise we could not affirm or deny anything of it moreover as we conceive the ideas that are in the minds of other spirits by means of our own which we suppose to be resemblances of them so we know other spirits by means of our own soul which in that sense is the image or idea of them it having a like respect to other spirits that blueness or heat by me perceived has to those ideas perceived by another 141 the natural immortality of the soul is a necessary consequence of the foregoing doctrine it must not be supposed that they who assert the natural immortality of the soul are of opinion that it is absolutely incapable of annihilation even by the infinite power of the creator who first gave it being but only that it is not liable to be broken or dissolved by the ordinary laws of nature or motion they indeed who hold the soul of man to be only a thin vital flame or system of animal spirits make it perishing and corruptible as the body since there is nothing more easily dissipated than such a being which is naturally impossible should survive the ruin of the tabernacle wherein it is enclosed and this notion has been greedily embraced and cherished by the worst part of mankind as the most effectual antidote against all impressions of virtue and religion but it has been made evident that bodies of what frame or texture soever are barely passive ideas in the mind which is more distant and heterogeneous from them than light is from darkness we have shown that the soul is indivisible incorporeal unextended and it is consequently incorruptible nothing can be plainer than that the motions changes decays and dissolutions which we hourly see befall natural bodies and which is what we mean by the course of nature cannot possibly affect an active simple uncompounded substance such a being therefore is indissoluble by the force of nature that is to say the soul of man is naturally immortal 142 after what has been said it is i suppose plain that our souls are not to be known in the same manner as senseless inactive objects or by way of idea spirits and ideas are things so wholly different that when we say they exist they are known or the like these words must not be thought to signify anything common to both natures there is nothing alike or common in them and to expect that by any multiplication or enlargement of our faculties we may be enabled to know a spirit as we do a triangle seems as absurd as if we should hope to see a sound this is inculcated because i imagine it may be of moment towards clearing several important questions and preventing some very dangerous errors concerning the nature of the soul we may not i think strictly be said to have an idea of an active being or of an action although we may be said to have a notion of them i have some knowledge or notion of my mind and its acts about ideas inasmuch as i know or understand what is meant by these words what i know that i have some notion of i will not say that the terms idea and notion may not be used convertibly if the world will have it so 
but yet it conduceth to clearness and propriety that we distinguish things very different by different names it is also to be remarked that all relations including an act of the mind we cannot so properly be said to have an idea but rather a notion of the relations and habitudes between things but if in the modern way the word idea is extended to spirits and relations and acts this is after all an affair of verbal concern 143 it will not be amiss to add that the doctrine of abstract ideas has had no small share in rendering those sciences intricate and obscure which are particularly conversant about spiritual things men have imagined they could frame abstract notions of the powers and acts of the mind and consider them pre as well from the mind or spirit itself as from their respective objects and effects hence a great number of dark and ambiguous terms presumed to stand for abstract notions have been introduced into metaphysics and morality and from these have grown infinite distractions and disputes amongst the learned 144 but nothing seems more to have contributed towards engaging men in controversies and mistakes with regard to the nature and operations of the mind than the being used to speak of those things in terms borrowed from sensible ideas for example the will is termed the motion of the soul this infuses a belief that the mind of man is as a ball in motion impelled and determined by the objects of sense as necessarily as that is by the stroke of a racket hence arise endless scruples and errors of dangerous consequence in morality all which i doubt not may be cleared and truth appear plain uniform and consistent could but philosophers be prevailed on to retire into themselves and attentively consider their own meaning 145 knowledge of spirits not immediate from what has been said it is plain that we cannot know the existence of other spirits otherwise than by their operations or the ideas by them excited in us i perceive several motions changes and combinations of ideas that inform me there are certain particular agents like myself which accompany them and concur in their production hence the knowledge i have of other spirits is not immediate as is the knowledge of my ideas but depending on the intervention of ideas by me referred to agents or spirits distinct from myself as effects or concomitant signs 146 but though there be some things which convince us human agents are concerned in producing them yet it is evident to every one that those things which are called the works of nature that is the far greater part of the ideas or sensations perceived by us are not produced by or dependent on the wills of men there is therefore some other spirit that causes them since it is repugnant that they should subsist by themselves see section twenty nine but if we attentively consider the constant regularity order and concatenation of natural things the surprising magnificence beauty and perfection of the larger and the exquisite contrivance of the smaller parts of creation together with the exact harmony and correspondence of the whole but above all the never enough admired laws of pain and pleasure and the instincts or natural inclinations appetites and passions of animals i say if we consider all these things and at the same time attend to the meaning and import of the attributes one eternal infinitely wise good and perfect we shall clearly perceive that they belong to the aforesaid spirit who works all in all and by whom all things consist 147 the existence of god more evident than that of man hence it is evident that god is known as certainly and immediately as any other mind or spirit whatsoever distinct from ourselves we may even assert that the existence of god is far more evidently perceived than the existence of men because the effects of nature are infinitely more numerous and considerable than those ascribed to human agents there is not any one mark that denotes a man or effect produced by him which does not more strongly evince the being of that spirit who is the author of nature for it is evident that in affecting other persons the will of man has no other object than barely the motion of the limbs of his body but that such a motion should be attended by or excite any idea in the mind of another depends wholly on the will of the creator he alone it is who upholding all things by the word of his power maintains that intercourse between spirits whereby they are able to perceive the existence of each other and yet this pure and clear light which enlightens every one is itself invisible 148 it seems to be a general pretence of the unthinking herd that they cannot see god could we but see him they say as we see a man we should believe that he is and believing obey his commands 
but alas we need only open our eyes to see the sovereign lord of all things with a more full and clear view than we do any one of our fellow creatures not that i imagine we see god as some will have it by a direct and immediate view or see corporeal things not by themselves but by seeing that which represents them in the essence of god which doctrine is i must confess to me incomprehensible but i shall explain my meaning a human spirit or person is not perceived by sense as not being an idea when therefore we see the colour a size figure and motions of a man we perceive only certain sensations or ideas excited in our own minds and these being exhibited to our view in sundry distinct collections serve to mark out unto us the existence of finite and created spirits like ourselves hence it is plain we do not see a man if by man is meant that which lives moves perceives and thinks as we do but only such a certain collection of ideas as directs us to think there is a distinct principle of thought and motion like to ourselves accompanying and represented by it and after the same manner we see god all the difference is that whereas some one finite and narrow assemblage of ideas denotes a particular human mind whithersoever we direct our view we do at all times and in all places perceive manifest tokens of the divinity everything we see hear feel or anywise perceive by sense being a sign or effect of the power of god as is our perception of those very motions which are produced by men 149 it is therefore plain that nothing can be more evident to any one that is capable of the least reflection than the existence of god or a spirit who is intimately present to our minds producing in them all that variety of ideas or sensations which continually affect us on whom we have an absolute and entire dependence in short in whom we live and move and have our being that the discovery of this great truth which lies so near and obvious to the mind should be attained to by the reason of so very few is a sad instance of the stupidity and inattention of men who though they are surrounded with such clear manifestations of the deity are yet so little affected by them that they seem as it were blinded with excess of light 150 objection on behalf of nature answer but you will say has nature no share in the production of natural things and must they be all ascribed to the immediate and sole operation of god i answer if by nature is meant only the visible series of effects or sensations imprinted on our minds according to certain fixed and general laws then it is plain that nature taken in this sense cannot produce anything at all but if by nature is meant some being distinct from god as well as from the laws of nature and things perceived by sense i must confess that word is to me an empty sound without any intelligible meaning annexed to it nature in this acceptation is a vain chimera introduced by those heathens who had not just notions of the omnipresence and infinite perfection of god but it is more unaccountable that it should be received among christians professing belief in the holy scriptures which constantly ascribe those effects to the immediate hand of god that heathen philosophers are wont to impute to nature the lord he causeth the vapours to ascend he maketh lightnings with rain he bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures jeremiah ten thirteen he turneth the shadow of death into the morning and maketh the day dark with night amos five eight he visiteth the earth and maketh it soft with showers he blesseth the springing thereof and crowneth the year with his goodness so that the pastures are clothed with flocks and the valleys are covered over with corn see psalm sixty five but notwithstanding that this is the constant language of scripture yet we have i know not what aversion from believing that god concerns himself so nearly in our affairs fain would we suppose him at a great distance off and substitute some blind unthinking deputy in his stead though if we may believe saint paul he be not far from every one of us 151 objection to the hand of god being the immediate cause threefold answer it will i doubt not be objected that the slow and gradual methods observed in the production of natural things do not seem to have for their cause the immediate hand of an almighty agent besides monsters untimely births fruits blasted in the blossom rains falling in desert places miseries incident to human life and the like are so many arguments that the whole frame of nature is not immediately actuated and superintended by a spirit of infinite wisdom and goodness but the answer to this objection is in a good measure plain from section sixty two 
it being visible that the aforesaid methods of nature are absolutely necessary in order to working by the most simple and general rules and after a steady and consistent manner which argues both the wisdom and goodness of god such is the artificial contrivance of this mighty machine of nature that whilst its motions and various phenomena strike on our senses the hand which actuates the whole is itself unperceivable to men of flesh and blood verily saith the prophet thou art a god that hidest thyself isaiah forty five fifteen but though the lord conceal himself from the eyes of the sensual and lazy who will not be at the least expense of thought yet to an unbiased and attentive mind nothing can be more plainly legible than the intimate presence of an all-wise spirit who fashions regulates and sustains the whole system of beings it is clear from what we have elsewhere observed that the operating according to general and stated laws is so necessary for our guidance in the affairs of life and letting us into the secret of nature that without it all reach and compass of thought all human sagacity and design could serve to no manner of purpose it were even impossible there should be any such faculties or powers in the mind see section thirty one which one consideration abundantly outbalances whatever particular inconveniences may thence arise 152 we should further consider that the very blemishes and defects of nature are not without their use in that they make an agreeable sort of variety and augment the beauty of the rest of the creation as shades in a picture serve to set off the brighter and more enlightened parts we would likewise do well to examine whether our taxing the waste of seeds and embryos and accidental destruction of plants and animals before they come to full maturity as an imprudence in the author of nature be not the effect of prejudice contracted by our familiarity with impotent and saving mortals in man indeed a thrifty management of those things which he cannot procure without much pains and industry may be esteemed wisdom but we must not imagine that the inexplicably fine machine of an animal or vegetable costs the great creator any more pains or trouble in its production than a pebble does nothing being more evident than that an omnipotent spirit can indifferently produce everything by a mere fiat or act of his will hence it is plain that the splendid profusion of natural things should not be interpreted weakness or prodigality in the agent who produces them but rather be looked on as an argument of the riches of his power 153 as for the mixture of pain or uneasiness which is in the world pursuant to the general laws of nature and the actions of finite imperfect spirits this in the state we are in at present is indispensably necessary to our well-being but our prospects are too narrow we take for instance the idea of some one particular pain into our thoughts and account it evil whereas if we enlarge our view so as to comprehend the various ends connections and dependencies of things on what occasions and in what proportions we are affected with pain and pleasure the nature of human freedom and the design with which we are put into the world we shall be forced to acknowledge that those particular things which considered in themselves appear to be evil have the nature of good when considered as linked with the whole system of beings 154 atheism and manichaeism would have few supporters if mankind were in general attentive from what has been said it will be manifest to any considering person that it is merely for want of attention and comprehensiveness of mind that there are any favourers of atheism or the manichaean heresy to be found little and unreflecting souls may indeed burlesque the works of providence the beauty and order whereof they have not capacity or will not be at the pains to comprehend but those who are masters of any justness and extent of thought and are withal used to reflect can never sufficiently admire the divine traces of wisdom and goodness that shine through the economy of nature but what truth is there which shineth so strongly on the mind that by an aversion of thought a wilful shutting of the eyes we may not escape seeing it is it therefore to be wondered at if the generality of men who are ever intent on business or pleasure and little used to fix or open the eye of their mind should not have all that conviction and evidence of the being of god which might be expected in reasonable creatures 155 we should rather wonder that men can be found so stupid as to neglect than that neglecting they should be unconvinced of such an evident and momentous truth and yet it is to be feared that too many of parts and leisure who live in christian countries are merely through a supine and dreadful negligence sunk into atheism since it is downright impossible that a soul pierced and enlightened with a thorough sense of the omnipresence holiness and justice of that almighty spirit should persist in a remorseless violation of his laws 
we ought therefore earnestly to meditate and dwell on those important points that so we may attain conviction without all scruple that the eyes of the lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good that he is with us and keepeth us in all places whither we go and giveth us bread to eat and raiment to put on that he is present and conscious to our innermost thoughts and that we have a most absolute and immediate dependence on him a clear view of which great truths cannot choose but fill our hearts with an awful circumspection and holy fear which is the strongest incentive to virtue and the best guard against vice 156 for after all what deserves the first place in our studies is the consideration of god and our duty which to promote as it was the main drift and design of my labours so shall i esteem them altogether useless and ineffectual if by what i have said i cannot inspire my readers with a pious sense of the presence of god and having shown the falseness or vanity of those barren speculations which make the chief employment of learned men the better dispose them to reverence and embrace the salutary truths of the gospel which to know and to practice is the highest perfection of human nature End of section 7 End of a Treatise Concerning the Principles of Human Knowledge by George Barclay